Good morning. Welcome to American Reformed Church. May this be a space where we feel united by God's love and grace. Please join me in this morning's call to worship as printed in the bulletin and on the screens. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all ye lands. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people. And the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endures to all generations. Please rise if you are able as we sing our song of worship, All Creatures of Our God and King. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. 
by God's love and grace, we experience a peace that passes all understanding. Friends, the peace of Christ be with you. Please take a moment to share that peace with those around you. introduced a, a prayer of confession done musically um, a few weeks ago, and we're going to um, do that again. Uh, so I ask that you would just um, uh, stay seated and uh, sing with us. Um, it's going to be very repetitive, um, and let this uh, sink in as our time of confession this morning. Oh God. Forgive us for this mess we've left Forgive us for the things we've done To you and to each other Let's try that together Oh God Forgive us for this mess we've left Forgive us for the things we've done To you and to each other Oh God Forgive us for this mess we've left Forgive us for the things we've done you and to each other Oh God oh, Give us for this mess we've left Won't you Forgive us for the things we've done Won't you, you and to each other Oh God, forgive us for this mess we've left, forgive us for the things we've done, to you and to each other. Oh God. Forgive us for this mess we've left. Won't you give us for the things we've done? Won't you 
to invite the children up for the children's message at this time, unless we have something else that I forgot. Know that we are forgiven people, so go out and live in the light of that forgiveness, and now we welcome the children forward. <laughs> Good morning, boys and girls. Let me ask you something. How, or do you have anything that you do that helps you remember key events? For example, if you have a birthday, what do you often do? What do you, you go to fun places? Maybe you have a, you get presents? All right, let's see. If you are in church and there's something you read in your Bible, do you ever see people who will highlight things? Do you have different colors in your Bible? Can you see that? Sometimes I'll highlight things that I want to remember. Um, or maybe you take notes. So I have a little notebook with me. Um, oh, how about what we just did? If there's something you want to remember, do you sometimes make it into a song? Anybody do that? Maybe? No? All right, that's okay. How about if there's something that you want to remember, do you ever take a picture of it? Do you, have, do you take pictures of fun things that you've done because you want to remember them? Yeah? Now, Let's say that we are back in the day when we did not have cell phones, and we did not have cameras, and things like that. So today, we're going to hear a story about a time that God wanted people to remember something. So they had been through something. So you remember that they were in Egypt, and they were slaves, and they were treated very badly. And so they cried out to God for help, and God sent Moses to lead them to freedom. Now, as he prepared them to leave, he had an event called the Passover. And he asked them to mark on their door if they were uh, children of God. And then he, he came through and he did something. Now, he wanted them to remember that. So they started... Um, a tradition called the Passover feast. Do you guys often when you get together to celebrate stuff? Do you guys eat? Do you like a if you have it on your birthday? What do you usually have? A birthday, a birthday cake. Yeah, that's a way to remember it. 
So that was this uh, Passover feast was a way for the people to remember that God flew over and saved them. Pretty cool, huh? Probably would have been easier to take a picture. Maybe? Yeah. All right. So, yeah, the, the story of Passover teaches us how important it is to remember. God wants us to remember the good things he has done in our lives, whether it's through celebration, photos, journals, traditions, songs, all of those things. We can, so we can keep those memories alive. So as we think about the Passover, let's remember to thank God for his love and protection, just like he showed the Israelites. And let's make our own memories that we can cherish and share with others, okay? Can you pray with me real quick? Dear God, thank you for loving us and for all the amazing things you do. Help us remember your goodness and share those memories with others. Amen. All right, thanks for coming up. Our song of preparation this morning is another new song. Um, so I'm going to invite you to stay seated. Um, and mostly if you want to listen um, this time through, maybe this is a song that we can begin to sing as a congregation. Um, but for now, um, these are words directly from Psalm 139. Um, the Psalms have been the songbook uh, for the church um, for as long as the church has been the church um, and, and before. Um, and so I'd like you to try to pick up on some of these words. This song, the psalm is probably familiar to you. So as we sing a, a, a chorus as it comes in, I just invite you to, to sing as you're able to um, kind of match what Amelia uh, and I are singing up here. Uh, but otherwise, just listen and use this as a, a way to prepare our hearts um, to cry out to God um, in our desperation, in our need. Um, psalm 139. <laughs> Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts when I am long, long gone. Where can I get away and flee your presence? Even in the skies and in the depths, you are there. Even if I rise on the wings of the dawn and settle on the sea, you know all my ways. You know all my ways Lord, you have searched me and know me You know of all my days and you created me I am fearfully and wonderfully made And I praise you Because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made And all your works are good You put me together in my mother's womb I am wonderfully made You put me together In my mother's womb You know all my Search me and know me and know my heart. Test me and know all my anxious thoughts. See if 
there is anything in me that gives you pain You know all my ways You put me together in my mother's womb I am wonderfully made you put me together in my mother's womb And all your works are good You put me together in my mother's womb You know all my ways Guide me, lead me and guide me, lead me and guide me on the everlasting road. You know all my ways. I am wonderfully made. Good morning. Let's pray together. God, you know us. You know our thoughts, you know our hearts, you know where we've been, you know where we're going. We pray this morning as we look to scripture that you would give us reminders of who you are and we pray that you would continue to guide us into who you are making us to be both as individuals and as a church. To guide our, guide our thoughts in our ears and our mouths as we hear the scripture, talk about the scripture and speak to us this morning. In your name we pray, amen. Good morning. It is good to be here in person this week and not just up on the screen. Uh, thank you for the grace last week of things coming up. And I didn't even get one call saying, hey, you're a bum who didn't show up for week three of work for the biggest thing. So I appreciate that. And it's good to be together this morning. This morning, we're going to continue in our sermon series. Again, this year, we're going through what's called the narrative lectionary. So we're reading stories in order as they appear in the Bible. The uh, Bible's a big book. We're not hitting all the stories. But last week we talked about Joseph, and this week we are jumping into Exodus. So Exodus 12, 1 through 13, join me as we read the scripture for this morning. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the 10th of this month they are to take the lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. And if a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided into, into proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A year old male, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which, they, in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over a fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night. And I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt. Both human beings and animals. 
On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. One thing about going through the narrative lectionary is that these scriptures are chosen for us. So it's always a fun exploration each week to see what will the sermon be as you read through that. I was curious, and this morning I want to talk about signs. Churches are well known for having signs. I think of us as kind of sign experts in a way. But with so many churches and so many signs, there's bound to be a few missteps. Like this first one. We love hurting people. You can see where they were going. It just kind of fell off. Or this next church that took it a little farther. Don't let worries kill you. Let the church help. Again, it's a good attempt. And sometimes we can just get tired of putting up signs, so you just go for the very basics. Like this next church. Too hot to keep changing signs. Sin bad. Jesus good. Details inside. I actually, I like that one. I say we could... That. But signs are extremely helpful, right? Signs tell us a lot of things. So earlier this week, I went for a walk around the neighborhood during the day. And because I'm thinking of signs and I'm thinking of this sermon, I decided to take pictures of the signs that I saw and think about how signs can help us. So this first one that I saw, right? Signs are helpful. They tell us the price of things rather than having to stop everywhere and ask. You can know before you ever go in. Signs also help us know that we're in the right place. Assuming in this case you want to be at stadium parking. Signs also tell us when we're in the wrong place. And we have signs that keep us from making bad decisions. The sign, if you can see, says no vehicles beyond this point. I like that that's outside one of the dorms at the college. So there's signs that do a lot of practical things, right? Signs tell us information, but signs can also give us a message. It can tell us even more. If you walk into the stadium at Northwestern, you'll see this big sign. It's like 30 feet wide. It's hard to miss. Uh, But this is a cool sign. It's a large banner that they have. This sign's going to tell you a few things. One, you could look very basic and say, okay, Northwestern's colors are red and white. They were the champions in 2022. But there's also something about the image, right? The image itself tells us something. It says, this image to me says, we're united, we're strong. And I always think with signs, whether it's a banner in a gym or whether it's a sign like this, whenever it says something about we were champions, and it it doesn't matter if it's back in 1975, we were champions, there's kind of this hopefulness in it of we were champions. So maybe we are champions, and maybe this year we can still be champions. So this is a good sign. I thought this was a cool sign to see. Again, signs tell us a lot. And then I started walking back because I didn't want Mary to worry about me too much. Uh, And as I walked back, I noticed outside, I noticed our bell. And I thought, I've driven past our bell a number of times. I saw there was a sign, a plaque on it. And I decided I'd walk up. So maybe you've read this before. Maybe you haven't. I'll read it out loud because it's hard to see up there. But our sign, American Reformed Church of Orange City, was established as a Dutch Reformed Church which spoke English rather than Dutch exclusively. In 1886, the first church building was erected at First Street Northwest and Arizona Avenue, but was struck by lightning and was completely destroyed by fire. The original bell was not recovered. Purchased by the Ladies' Aid of American Reformed Church for a second time, This bell was located in the church building from 1897, surviving a fire in 1926. We had a lot of problems with fires back then, until 1970, when the congregation moved to this current location. So first off, just the fact that that bell uh, started out in 1897 is a pretty amazing thing. But right, this is a sign. It's not a very big sign, but it's a sign that can tell us a lot about our history. What things have people experienced? You wonder, what was it like for American Reformed Church when their building burned down because it got struck by lightning? How did that group of people pull together? This can start to make us wonder about our own history as a church. So signs and symbols, they're extremely important They can help us know where we've been. They can help us know where we are. They can also help us guide us to where we're going. In our reading this morning, we learn about the first time that the Passover feast is being instituted. Last week, we talked about Joseph and Joseph's brothers. Now, that's the story that ends the book of Genesis. So when we left off last week, Joseph and his brothers, they found shelter in 
Egypt, right? Joseph was one of the main leaders of the country, so they're leading Egypt, and they find respite in a time of famine. They find food and shelter. Turn the page, one page in your Bible, and we're now jumping ahead generations. Now Joseph and his 11 brothers have had kids, and they've had kids. Suddenly the nation of Israel, which is those brothers and their descendants, are getting more and more. And the beginning of, of Exodus gives us this one line that mentions the new Pharaoh did not know Joseph. So there's not love for the Israelite people anymore. Instead, there starts to be a fear that this group of people is growing and that their strength as a community is growing as well. So the Egyptians make them slaves. And Pharaoh even goes so far to control the population that he calls for all the firstborn sons to be thrown into the Nile. Then perhaps you know what comes next. God calls a man named Moses sends him to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites, God's people, go. The Pharaoh refuses, so God says, sends ten plagues. For the first nine, Pharaoh stands his ground and says, oh no, you guys aren't leaving. A couple of false hopes in the middle of it, but in the end he says no. But God knows that this tenth plague that he's going to bring, this is going to be the thing that's going to push Pharaoh over the edge. This is the thing that is going to make Pharaoh say, get out of here. I just want to talk about this image that we see in this scripture because God gives the people this physical action. God knows what's going to happen. God knows that they're going to be released. So he says, before it happens, I'm going to give you this ritual, this physical sign that you can use to remember what I'm about to do. So I want to think about some of the symbolism in this passage that we read this morning. Just a few things. There's a lot. Uh, but an unblemished lamb, a symbol, here you'll just see an artist rendition of of the people during the Passover and an unblemished lamb, a symbol of people offering the best of what they have to a God that deserves their best. They need to take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts. Now that might be something that as we sit here this morning, you might raise your eyes at a little bit. We don't do a whole lot of blood rituals in the church anymore, but this is a symbol. When we think about blood, it's something that all of us have running through our veins in the ancient world. Blood is a symbol for life. So this idea that a life has to be given, there has to be a sacrifice for Israel to be free. Uh, blood represents the sacrifice. A couple of other things, if you didn't catch it from the reading. When the food is prepared, they have to eat it all that night. When the night comes to eat it, they have to eat it all. If they don't eat it, they have to burn it the next morning. The bread is made without yeast because there isn't going to be time for the bread to rise when God leads them and calls them out of Egypt. They have to wear, it says that they have to eat hurriedly or they have to eat with urgency and they have to be wearing their clothes, sandals on their feet, holding their walking sticks. So again, you can picture this whole thing. It's when God comes and calls you to do something, you as a people need to be ready to respond and you need to be ready to respond quickly. So God's giving them this so that they can remember what it was like when God called them out. And this isn't just a ritual for the people who are in Egypt in that moment. This is a tradition that continues to this very day. This is for the people that are leaving Egypt. This is also for the Jewish people through all time. This is for the future so they can remember what God has done for them. There's a lot of power in having a physical practice to remembering what God has done for us. Our bodies and our minds are tied together uh, in ways that help each other. And as I was on my walk the other day, I came across Northwestern. I assumed, I thought to myself, I don't think I've been in some of the buildings since I moved away 13 years ago. And I thought, I think it's okay for alumni just to walk into the buildings. Uh, no one kicked me out while I was in there. So I walked in, and it was interesting to walk into the chapel, and I walked into Van Persum Hall, and when you start walking up steps, suddenly memories that I had start to come back. Sometimes things that if you just were to sit and reflect on something you don't think of, but then you're physically there and suddenly you're walking up steps you've walked up before. Have you guys had things like that? Maybe it's that you're, someone's cooking out of the family cookbook. You cook something that your grandma used to cook and suddenly you smell it and you're transported back to that moment in time, back to your grandma's kitchen. Maybe you hear that song on the radio and then suddenly you're not just sitting in your car anymore, you're awkwardly trying to sway and slow dance to that first slow dance with that first person at that school dance. We've had it lately because we're going through so many boxes, so maybe you open up that box of old toys in your basement 
right? You pull out either that first stuffed animal that you had if you saved it, and suddenly it just brings back these memories, these physical uh, things are important in helping us remember. And I wondered to myself, what would it look like if a group of people said, hey, we know how helpful, we know how helpful it can be to have physical rituals to help us remember. What would it look like for a group of people to decide they were going to remember something? I want us to imagine something as a group together. Are you... You're willing, you have to be. You can't really say no at this point. But let's imagine that there's a group of people. They live in one place, and then they all say to each other, you know what, we think there's actually opportunities over in that other place. So we're all going to go together. So they all say, all right, let's do it. So they go, they get together, they move over to this new place, they start to settle in, they start to find their rhythm, but something pops into their minds. They say, wait, what if we forget the old place? We love the new place, we love what we're doing, but we don't want to forget where we came from. We don't want to forget the old place. So what if we did something to remember? They all agree this is a pretty good idea. It's a pretty agreeable group of people. So they sit down and they say, okay, well, what do we want to do? Like, what would be special we want to remember? I imagine them sitting in a room like this, looking at each other, thinking, okay, what was special about where we were? There's probably silence like this, people thinking. Suddenly John's like, well, I have one idea. He's like, I remember when we used to, you know, we used to have to wash the streets, right? We just had buckets and we had brooms and we'd go up and we'd wash the streets and we'd scrub them and everyone's like, that wasn't the most fun thing we did back home, but sure, we could, they don't want to kill the momentum of the conversation, so they're like, sure, we could probably do the street, the street scrubbing thing, that's fine. Any other ideas? And then Jill over here says, oh, the thing I missed the most about back home was the flowers. We had these tulips everywhere. Wouldn't it be awesome if we just planted a ton of tulips all over the place? And everyone's like, now we're talking. Now we've got some energy. Yes, we'll do the street scrubbing thing. We'll do the tulip thing. What else do we have? And then Todd is just like, you know, we could. We're wearing comfortable shoes now. But remember when we used to use the wooden shoes <laughs> when we were out in the fields and we were working? What if we just wore wooden shoes? And everyone's like, yeah, that would be different. And then, you know, Chuck jumps in like, and we could make a marching band wear them. That confuses everyone. Everyone's like, I, we didn't do that back home. But sure, just like the street scrubby thing, we could do that. And before you know it, this group of people start to develop an annual festival that they put together and they do so that they can remember where they came from. Are you with me? They start to remember what they do and maybe it even gets so popular that people who join their community now who don't share that history might even start to participate in the festival as a way to be a part of the group now, right? So these physical rituals that we have, they're important. We remember things and we have them all around us even if we don't always think of them as such. We have signs and symbols and rituals and I'm guessing that as we talked about this ritual of Passover, some of you guys probably jumped ahead of me in the sermon. When you talk about an unblemished lamb and sacrifice for the saving of people, I'm sure some of you were thinking to yourself, that sounds a little bit like Jesus. Good job. You get 10 ARC points and you can redeem those for free coffee after the service. <laughs> but, Jesus give, but Jesus is the sign. Jesus comes. It's an interesting thing. We have our own signs. Again, I'm assuming, not that there's maybe not any, but I'm assuming that there's not many of us that come from a Jewish lineage. I'm assuming that, again, there might be some, but I'm guessing that that's not something most of us uh, have in this community. But we do have our own, as Christians, we have our own uh, practices that we have. In fact, next week we'll do one of them, communion, right? When we break bread and we pour wine. And it's an interesting thing with Jesus. When Jesus institutes this, when Jesus gives us communion, he gives it to us while him and the disciples are celebrating Passover. And Jesus makes this connection for us where somehow the promises of Passover also come to us through the promises of communion, through the promises of what Jesus has done for the sacrifice that Jesus is about to give for us on the cross. He gives us the Last Supper to remember. We're a perfect person in Jesus, an unblemished lamb would shed his blood for us so that we would be able to find new life in communion with God. So we have this physical connection through communion. And in the church, we also have the physical practice of baptism that we practice together as well. 
where we remember how Christ's life, death, and resurrection washes us clean and brings us to new life. These verses in Exodus show us a birth of the Passover ritual. And in verse 13, it says, this will be a sign to you, talking to the Israelite people. It's a sign to them. The blood on the door isn't a magical symbol that keeps God out. They're not casting spells when they wear certain clothing or hold their walking sticks. It's a symbol to them. It's a physical sign to the people of Israel when they see that on their doorposts, they're reminded of God's protection and God's love for them. And, in our, and they see that it's a sign that when God shows up, they have to be ready to go. And in our sacraments, in our signs, we're reminded that of what Christ has done for us and that it's something that didn't just happen long ago, but it's something that happens now. Salvation is here, and we are experiencing it now, and we need reminders of that in our lives over and over again. Because while there's a lot of hope in the Passover, in the promise of Passover, there's a darkness that hangs over this story. As I mentioned at the beginning of Exodus, Pharaoh looks to kill every firstborn male in the Israelite community by throwing them in the Nile. There's anger and there's hatred and there's fear which leads to the dehumanizing of others in order to try to ensure the self-preservation of Egypt. Pharaoh's refusal to let Egypt leave has led to a point where God is going to do something that, if I'm being honest, shocks and troubles me a bit. Because while those with the blood of the lamb are safe, there's houses where death is going to come across the land and that question comes into my mind and maybe your mind too of how could God do that? I don't have a good answer for that this morning, but I do think as we have it in the story, it's an important part of the story that speaks to a very true part of being human, and we don't want to move past it, and we don't want to miss it, because there's life found when we are worshiping in, in communion with the giver of life. When we live in the spirit and we treat people with love, respect, kindness, and understanding, there is life that comes out of those relationships and in those moments. But there are also times where we as people live out hate, envy, malice, racism, and all we do is bring a type of death into the world. The story of Pharaoh and the people of Israel is a cautionary tale to us about the danger of treating people in a way that makes them less than human. It not only brings death to us, but just like the Pharaoh, it brings death to those around us. And while God promises to save those who seek God and promises to bring good out of bad situations, God does not promise to keep us from sinning and making the world a worse place. So we have to be aware of that our actions have consequences. Through us, God can bring life or death, and the stark contrast that we see between Pharaoh and Moses and the Israelites can speak to us and help remind us that our decisions and actions matter. So every day as we make decisions about who we are and what we're going to do, it's helpful to have signs that remind us that we are sons and daughters of God. We are saved by Christ, and it's from that identity that we should be making our decisions of how we're going to act, how we're going to treat people. So we've talked about how as a church we gather together. We have things like communion, baptism, even this, us gathering weekly in worship is something that we do. It's a sign to remind us of our God. But if we're being honest, we're only together so much in a week. So while annual things are great, while monthly things are great, while weekly things are great, I think it's also important for us each to have something individually in our own lives that's reminding us of our faith day in and day out. That can look super simple. That might be an actual sign. Maybe you actually write something on a post-it note and you put it somewhere that you're going to see every day. Maybe it's a favorite scripture. Maybe it's a prayer. Something to remind yourself of who, who you are and whose you are. Maybe if you have a regular uh, prayer time, one thing if you're looking to get more physical uh, with your prayer, prayer beads are a great guided meditation, uh, a way to get not only your mind but your body involved as well. One book that speaks to, the, to coming up with rituals for everyday life is a book called Liturgy of the Ordinary by Tish Harrison Warren. Uh, it's a book where Warren lays out practices for an ordinary day taking ordinary things and doing them intentionally. That can help us be intentional about finding God in our day-to-day -day life. And I'd like to share one of her ideas in order to get us wondering about how 
Just guess wondering what practices might you find in your day-to-day -day life to give them meaning. Uh, the first ritual she talks about is making her bed. I like, she talks about making her bed. She says one year right before Lent, she became interested with the idea of making her bed. She read an article somewhere, and she started asking her friends, do you make your bed in the morning? Because she did not. Just out of curiosity, be brave here. How many people here make your bed in the morning? I should put my hand down because I don't. I'm just curious. Okay, all right, so even here, a surprising number of people. Nice work. So she's like, I wonder about making my bed. At the same time, she was like, I have this problem in the morning. In the morning, she said, the first thing that I do every morning is I roll over and I grab my phone. She's like, it's not long. It's five to 10 minutes, but it's the first thing that I do. And she uses this great analogy. She's like, you know, uh, she's like, we have a rescue animal place near us. And she said, when baby animals are born, if their mom, they imprint on something, whether it's their mom or if their mom's not there, they imprint on something. And she said, it's almost like every morning, in those few minutes, I was imprinting on my phone. And I felt this pull to it for the rest of the day as I started it. So she said for lunch, she decided she was going to combine these things. She said, I'm going to make my bed first thing every morning before I do anything else. And she does this for Lent. And I'm just going to read. You can follow along up here, too. I want to read the short. Uh, this is a reflection after she did it that I thought was good. Instead of going to a device for a morning fix of instant infotainment, I touched the tangible softness of our well-worn covers, tugged against wrinkled cotton, felt the hard wood beneath my bare feet, and in the creation story, God enters chaos and made order and beauty. In making my bed, I reflected that creative act in the tiniest, most ordinary way. In my small chaos, I made small order. I love that. It's good, right? It shows that how something mundane and simple can be combined with intentionality and it can help us, help guide us to God. And when we are mindful of God and what God has done and you start looking for these signs, it's kind of like my walk the other day. When you start looking for signs, you realize there are signs all over the place. And as we start looking for God, if you're intentional about it, you start seeing God in more and more places in your day-to-day -day life. So we started out by talking about God instituting the Passover. It's an event that will forever remind people of things like God calling Moses through a burning bush. Ten plagues on the nation of Egypt. Their God showing that God promises to protect them to be more powerful than the gods of other nations. There are these really big, mystical, huge ideas. And the way that God helps people remind and remember, or helps people remember these events are through simple things like food and clothes all the way down to earthly things like we all have the very blood in our veins. Sometimes the best reminders are the simple things, those signs and rituals that are around us every day, reminding us to remember the amazing, miraculous signs that God has done for us. We do it right now as we gather in worship. We'll do it next week as we take communion. And hopefully, we can each find our own way in our daily lives to turn us towards God each and every day. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please pray with me. Loving and ever-present God, you gave us your Son because your love for the world knows no end. We are so grateful. Today, we ask for peace in our world. Let your spirit move freely among us, breaking down walls of fear, suspicion, and hatred. Heal the divisions in our human family and unite us in love, justice, and peace. We lift up our country to you. Help us nurture a life together built on truth and goodness. Teach us how to share our blessings so that those struggling in poverty may find hope, dignity, and joy. For those who are suffering, wrap them in your love. Be their strength when they feel weak, their comfort when they are in pain, and their hope when they feel lost. Give them the courage to keep moving forward, even when the road is hard. We bring our families before you, especially the ones we hold close. Protect them, Lord. Be with them in the hard moments and give them peace. 
Help us all to grow in love, understanding, and trust with one another. And for your church, Lord, keep us rooted in the truth of your gospel. Help us respond to the needs of others and use the gifts you've given us for your glory. May our faith, our worship, and our lives bear witness to the saving power of Jesus Christ. We pray all of these things, Lord, in the name of Christ, and we echo the prayer that you taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Because of God's generosity to us, we give offerings of thanks to further his kingdom in the world. Offerings may be placed in the box in the back, or you may mail them to the main office. Um, you can even pay online. So please rise to sing the doxology as our offerings are brought forward. Please remain standing for our song of response, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, tune my heart to sing Thy grace, streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues of praise his name i'm fixed upon it name of god's redeeming love Hitherto thy has blessed me, thou hast drawn me to this place, and I know thy hand will lead me safely home by thy good grace. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of 
to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be, let thy goodness like a fetter, find my wandering heart to thee, Lord, to wander, Lord, I feel it, Lord, to leave the God I here's my Friends, may you go and may you see signs of God's love all around you. And may those signs remind you that you are a loved child of God the Almighty. And may those signs help guide you in your life day in and day out. Go in peace. Oh, uh-huh.